I'm Mary Curtis with Stewards of Change. I have uh, the responsibility of moderating this panel and making sure we stay on time. We have a lot of folks here um, who will be speaking. The session is about preparing the future, leveraging health reform to ensure linkages between human services and health and the near term and short term. And really, what do we have to do right now to take advantage of this moment in time where the funding is available, we, we, we have the leadership and the political will in many places to do this. So, so how do we take advantage of it? What, are, what can we do and how can the federal government help us work here? Today presenting will be Daryl Graskin from JHU, mm -hmm. the School of Public Health. Um, Daryl's gonna present I said Graskin, it's Gaskin. Daryl's going to present an overview of, of what's happening in the states with regard to the ACA. And then Joe Bodmer is going to present on how we can connect human services into this opportunity. And then Henry Chow is going to present on the opportunities in Sasayo. Um, all, th all three of these speakers are very flexible and interactive. Um, we are going to give you op the opportunity to, to ask questions in between speaking. And then after that, we have a, a panel of responders that will reflect and respond back to this group, and there'll be maybe some interactive back and forth then as well if we have time. And that panel will be Dr. Hazel from Virginia, Dr. Sharfstein from Maryland, and Ivan Handler from Illinois. Tom Baden was not able to make it today because of um, you know, contracting and budget issues back home, which I'm sure we're all familiar with. Um, so without taking up a lot more time, I, you know, I, I invite you to please read the bios in, in your packet on, on these speakers. And um, let's, let's hear from Daryl Gaskin. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Mary, for uh, that kind introduction, and uh, I'm certainly appreciative of the opportunity to come and talk to you all about um, um, health insurance exchanges and, um, and how they're being implemented across the country. Uh, and just before I get started, I want to just uh, let you all know that um, uh, the comments that I'm making are, are strictly my own, and while I am a member of the Maryland Health uh, Benefit Exchange Board, uh, I'm not speaking on their behalf, and, uh, and certainly um, um, while I'm a faculty member here at um, Hopkins, I'm not speaking on behalf of uh, Johns Hopkins, but myself. So having said that, um, the, the Affordable Care Act established uh, health insurance exchanges as a mechanism for providing health insurance for persons above 133% of the federal poverty line uh, and below, um, and, and persons between 133% of the federal poverty line and below 400% uh, of the federal poverty line are eligible for premium tax credits as well as um, cost sharing subsidies. Uh, the exchange is going to offer individuals the opportunity to purchase insurance from what we call qualified health plans, and these qualified health plans will provide average provider, uh, adequate provider coverage. Uh, they'll uh, contract with community providers. They'll um, use uh, navigators to conduct outreach, and uh, and then they'll also uh, monitor the performance standards of. Um, of qualified uh, health plans. And the qualified health plans are gonna um, provide four basic types of coverage, uh, something uh, we call it bronze, silver, gold, and platinum, so not quite the Olympics, but I guess it's the Olympics Plus. Uh, and they vary on the basis of the amount of coverage that they provide relative to something which we're gonna call the uh, essential health package, uh, ranging from 60 to 90% of that package, and then uh, limiting the out-of-pocket out um, um, payments to the uh, uh, health savings accounts um, limits. Um, the exchange um, is going to essentially, it's not, we're not providing insurance, but we're uh, providing a call center for um, um, 
customer service and then establishing procedures and, and enrollment uh, practices for individuals and businesses and as, all, as well as um, determining the eligibility uh, for um, tax credits. Now states have three options if they're going to, to have an exchange. Uh, they could either launch their own state-based um, exchange, they could do a state um, partnership with the federal government, or they could elect to do a um, federally, or elect to use a federally um, facilitated exchange without uh, doing a partnership. Uh, when a state decides to do a state-based exchange, the state assumes uh, basically all the operation responsibilities. Um, the state uh, can use the federal government to do things like risk adjustment, reassurance, or to determine um, tax credits and, and cost sharing arrangements. Um, um, but they don't necessarily have to. The, uh, the, if the state decides to be a partner with the federal government, and essentially what they're doing is they're using the federal um, exchange, and but they are, are doing some of the front end things like um, consumer assistance and plan management, or they could elect to do both. And in this case, they also can do uh, the reinsurance on their own or the Medicaid eligibility on their own, or uh, they can um, um, let those things be done by, by the federal government. And finally, if the state elects to do a federally facilitated exchange without doing a partnership, then in, in a sense, HHS will operate the exchange, and the state could elect to, under that arrangement, elect to still do their own reinsurance program and their own Medicaid and CHIP um, uh, determination. Now the implementation for the exchange has a, a really tight um, on timeline. Uh, states have until November, uh, I think it's 16th of this year, to submit a blueprint for approval um, of either their state-based plan or their state uh, partnership insurance um, partnership plan. Uh, and if the blueprint is not submitted, then um, um, that state is assumed that they're going to actually just uh, use the federally um, facilitated exchange. And then uh, HHS is going to approve uh, or conditionally approve the exchange uh, in January of next year and then with the expectation that we'll be fully operational in January of, the, of 2014. Now this basically has given us about a three and a half year window uh, between the passing of the Affordable Care Act and the state exchanges to, to do the things that are politically necessary, administratively necessary, and operationally necessary to get um, an exchange up and running. And politically, what, what we're talking about here is that states have to pass legislation authorizing the creation of an exchange or an agency to, to operate an exchange within its borders. Um, this involves balancing the interests of the various um, stakeholders, uh, which are um, within the confines of those, the, what's outlined in the Affordable Care Act. The major decisions include such things as overall organizational structure, the agency's relationship to the state, the competition of its uh, board of director, source of, of um, financial support, the, the ability to use active versus selective uh, purchasing or contracting, and then um, defining the relationship between the individual, uh, the exchange for individuals, and the exchange for uh, small businesses. Administratively, the exchanges have to also do things like they got to recruit a talented management team and supporting staff to actually stand up the exchange, uh, develop operational policies and procedures. They need to establish a, a brand in the state um, and that's going to essentially define the consumer's experience with the exchange. They have to work with their state legislature and executive branch to establish rules and procedures around ex essential health benefits, qualified health plans, uh, navigators, what their role are, the role of brokers in the state, and then ultimately um, the experience of consumers who will use the exchange. And then operationally, um, 
the exchanges just, they have to work in a real sense. Um, so this is sort of developing the information technology infrastructure that uh, is essentially what uh, people will experience uh, when they, they access the, the exchange to buy um, health insurance. And, um, and in a real sense, you want to make sure that that, ex that experience is pleasant, uh, that it gives a, a, a sense to the consumer that they've been, and they've been empowered, they've been enabled to, to um, um, purchase something uh, that they want, and then ultimately that they have a, a satisfactory um, uh, experience. Now, to facilitate the creation of these exchanges, the federal government has offered some financial support, uh, which come in the form of these level one and these uh, level um, two um, establishment grants. The level one grants. Um, they support uh, primarily the, the, the sort of the planning stage of, of, these, um, of implementing the exchange. So the grants have been used for things like doing background research, uh, talking to, to stakeholders, uh, making um, the legislative and regulatory changes in the state to accommodate the exchange, um, to, to figure out what the governance structure should be, uh, to do a lot of work re regarding figuring out how the IT interface is going to work, um, to figure out the, um, or to conduct the um, uh, analysis to figure out how you're going to financially support the, the exchange and, uh, as you look forward in the future, to do, to do some oversight and, and to ensure the, um, the program's uh, integrity. And then after um, states can apply for uh, more than one um, um, level one grant, depending upon what their needs are, and then when they're at a state where they're ready to do their implementation, they can apply for a level two establishment grant, and this carries them through the first year of the um, of the implementation, and during that year, what we expect or what's expected of the states is that they would establish um, the the legal authority for for um, having uh, having and operating an exchange and make sure that it it complies with all the federal uh, requirements that the governing structure would be in place that they would certainly have a, a plan and a budget that carries them through to 2015 in terms of sustainability and that the um, um, the plan would outline steps for doing fraud and waste and abuse um, prevention, and then um, we would be able to describe the, uh, the consumer um, uh, assistance portion of the exchange and that, that uh, in particular, um, the provision of the call center and how people will interface with the exchange. Now, so that's a, a tall task for, for everyone to try to do in, in, in just a few years. Uh, to date, um, 14 states, including, and including the District of Columbia, have established an exchange through um, either legislation or by executive order. Uh, and three states have a plan actually to, to establish an exchange. 16 states are just sort of sitting and, and, well, I shouldn't say sitting, but they're sort of studying their options at this time. And then the, for 15 states, they're just, there's no activity in terms of, at all in terms of, of um, developing an exchange. And two states have just decided that they're, they're, they're not going to create an exchange at all. Um, so this, I mean, depending upon whether you want to say the glass is half empty or the glass is half full, you could say most states are doing something. Uh, if you want to say that it's half empty, then you really, you're really, we're really talking about 14 states in the District of Columbia that are really trying to push ahead and 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 get this, this get this done. Um, Twelve states have decided they're not they're not really going to to do anything, or they've actually stopped their their planning until the Supreme Court issues its decision regarding its the constitutionality. And uh, and um, and five states in particular just have not are not pursuing um, exchange legislation, or until the Supreme Court rules. And so they're really sort of putting themselves in a in a in a real tight bind because the window gets very short. And as I stated, there's a, there are a lot of things that need to be done. 
Uh, the 14 states that have established exchanges, uh, um, um, they've had to make some uh, very um, important and key design decisions because um, um, you have to determine the exchange structure and its governance. Um, for the most part, it seems as though quasi-governance structures are the thing in which most states are trying to do, uh, to, in a sense trying to both limit the influence of, of, of elected officials as well as of interest groups. Um, if you look at eight of the 15 states are, are do, using these quasi-governmental um, uh, structures. Four states that have implemented exchange actually have created them as state agencies. And then one state has gone the route of just creating a uh, not-for-profit corporation that would, would run the, the exchange. The governance boards uh, vary in composition, so there's variation there. Uh, and some boards include the stakeholders, i.e. the providers, insurers, brokers, and so forth. And some boards exclude them and then use advisory groups in order to um, inf uh, have stakeholder input. Uh, the boards vary in size from, from five persons to, to 15. And um, um, in terms of uh, trying to figure out the, the, the exchange's relationship to, to the qualified health plans, uh, one of the very um, big decisions is whether you're going to be a clearinghouse or whether you're going to use um, selective or active contracting to decide which plans are able to offer uh, health plans within the exchange. Um, to, here the decisions vary. Uh, seven of the states say that they are going to do some sort of active purchasing or selective contracting or at least um, will make that something in which their, their um, boards have the authority to do. Three absolutely say they won't do it. There's going to be essentially clearing houses and the five that the other five have, haven't decided which way um, they're going to go. Uh, financing the exchange is, is also an important issue because uh, the federal funds are going to uh, carry, carry us through the end of 2014, but the thought is, is by after uh, 2015 that they would be um, self-sustaining. Uh, and most everyone says that we'll take public and private grants to help support our exchange which seems, certainly seems to be reasonable. Uh, nine states have decided that they're going to allow their exchanges to collect fees from insurance carriers to support it. Uh, some states have also have the authority to access um, um, public appropriations through the, the state appropriation process. Uh, one state in particular has decided that that's not something which they're going to allow uh, their exchange to do. And then, and then finally, um, I think the, 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 the sort of real major piece is essentially the, the exchange. Well, even if you have both the um, uh, um, administrative and legislative processes and procedures outlined, the thing has to work. And, and so what we're trying to do is, is something which is, is um, an enormous task because uh, we want to give the uh, consumer a seamless, a pleasant experience in purchasing um, uh, insurance products online and then also have that interface with um, Medicaid and CHIP eligibility and in some cases have it interface with other eligibility for other public programs. And so these are, are, are in some cases a quasi-public agency talking with, with public agencies that necessarily have not talked to each other. And so um, this requires, in, in a real sense, a significant upgrade in, in the existing Medicaid and S-CHIP eligibility uh, systems. And um, like I said, a, a few states have sort of thought, well, and while we're doing that, we might as well also consider how we can do the interface with our other public programs. Um, um, to date, uh, I think uh, uh, um, states have varied in, in terms of where they are on the, uh, the adoption of these, um, these um, IT uh, infrastructures. 
and uh, um, some have already begun to, to contract with, with um, uh, IT providers to, all, to provide these services. Um, but the, the proof is going to be in the pudding in the sense that we won't, you know, we won't know whether these things are going to work the way they're supposed to work until people actually start uh, enrolling and we start beta testing and doing those kinds of things like that. So I think this is, this is where the real challenge is in, in making the, in the exchanges work. And um, I, I think for the most part I've done my homework uh, in the sense I've done my assignment, I should say, in sort of giving you all a, uh, a, a basic overview. And then I'm going to leave it to our, our other speakers to actually sort of fill in uh, the details. Thank you very much. Okay, Joe Bodmer, you're up next. Thank you for speaking today. Um, Mr. Gaskins makes a comment about the interfaces, um, talking about they've got to be brought up, and in some cases, um, they need to be connected or are going to be connected to human services. That's where I come in. My job is to stir the Kool-Aid and then see if I can get everybody to drink it. <laughs> um, right now, what we're seeing across the country is a dread and fear and running around like chickens with their head cut off because they think the sky is going to fall and they're not going to get anything done with eligibility and enrollment systems being integrated horizontally with the human service programs, that there's not enough time. And we keep looking at it and trying to convince everybody, you're not trying to build a complete human service system in the next three and a half years. It's not going to happen. It was never done before. What's going to make this different? 90% money on the table doesn't make everything speed up and happen without project delays. That's not what we're trying to accomplish here. We're trying to sit there and piggyback on what CMS is doing in ways that are going to upgrade and enhance and in some cases, and actually in about a third of the cases, actually reintegrate mm -hmm. health and human services across the country uh, with their eligibility and enrollment systems. Um, there is a lot of time to do that. What we're seeing right now is we're trying to push states to do the planning. There's 18 months um, in ways that they can accomplish both a planning APD, but also uh, get the procurement activities accomplished so that the contractor literally hits the ground running on January 1st, 2014. That gives them two full years with the 9010 money, the A87 waiver, uh, to accomplish a lot of this horizontal integration. There are, obviously, with the tri-agency letter, and I think everybody here is probably familiar with that, there are a number of, really, we consider to be, for human services, key uh, uh, modules, functions, components of, an, of a truly integrated health and human services environment. Data analytics on top of a data warehouse is one. We think being able to sit there and look at our client universe and, uh, and define for, uh, for ourselves why they keep coming back for services or why they haven't gotten this service or that service or gone through this door or that door trying to create that no wrong door approach through customer service portals and a unified case intake module we think is critically important. Setting up the infrastructure for a service oriented architecture in the future so that maintenance can drop, uh, a, a more tightly integrated system can be built uh, through what we call an agile process replacing components at a time, small projects. You don't have to do a huge project all the time. Sometimes you just take off little bites of that apple at a time, but using an SOA architecture can allow you to do that in ways that we think you can be much more successful without the, uh, the added risks of a uh, major overhaul or replacement project. And there are other um, aspects uh, that, we're, that we're looking at here. And as y'all probably, or some of y'all are aware, we have a, a funding announcement that's come, that's come out with the forecast that's been published for the state system's interop interoperability grants. Uh, those grants, that forecast is being published today as a funding opportunity announcement. 
So for all, it's for states only. It's not for, gonna be for localities or anything like that. Um, but what we're looking for is for those states who succeed with their proposals to do the planning. Uh, if they can do the planning through procurement, uh, at least the documentation for the procurement, uh, and then write a report about all their experiences, both good and bad, about getting this planning phase done, uh, and share those documents with us so that we can share them with everybody else in the country. That's what the intent of those grants are for. Uh, and we're hoping we're gonna get a lot of uh, uh, interest in that funding announcement. It's $5 million, by the way, uh, available for grants anywhere from 750 to 1.125 million. So we're looking at probably four or five grants uh, being successful. Having said that, let me get back to what we think the, the key issues for us are. That is for states to reach out to our office, to FNS and my counterpart, Karen Painter Jacques, uh, to Chuck Lehman over at CMS. We've already drank the Kool Aid. We're pushing this. Uh, my counterparts are pushing this uh, with one voice. We are trying to convince states that integration is the way to go, that not to be integrated after this 9010 money is, is gone is insane in our minds because maintaining interfaces in that way, as opposed to a true level of integration, is always gonna be much more uh, expensive uh, from a maintenance perspective. State, state regulation always changes. Lord knows, federal regulations are always changing. Congress always thinks they've got a better idea the next day. Um, so trying to maintain interfaces between multiple systems, and it's multiple systems here, not only the various human service systems, but also the health systems, uh, is, is just very difficult, especially when, if you had integration, you'd have a set of rules that would allow you to manage the data within those systems, uh, as opposed to running an interface with different definitions on both sides of that interface. But if you integrate, you can at least coordinate those definitions so the, the maintenance of those systems is much easier. And that's what we're trying to push uh, with our, our, state, uh, our state partners. One of the things that we think uh, needs to be done, uh, as I said, is getting a planning APD in the house to us as soon as possible. We don't have nearly enough of those yet um, to take advantage of both the 9010 money and the 87 waivers. Uh, we are getting ready, we have, and you may have heard it mentioned uh, this morning, that we're publishing a list of states that we consider to be best practice. Uh, those states have agreed willingly to allow their names with contact information so that you know who to call to get a copy of their PAPD or their IAPD, their RFP. Uh, with a description of the project, including the programs that are participating in that uh, horizontally integrated project, uh, and what they're attempting to accomplish with it. Is it gonna be a full integration? Is it just the eligibility and enrollment module? Uh, what are they doing in that project? Uh, and in some respects, you'll even have uh, some information about uh, the, the milestones they've already achieved or the ones that they have yet to achieve in that narrative description for each one of these states. We are talking to a number of other states to see if we can convince them uh, to also uh, come out and, and be a partner with their other states so that they will also share their documentation. We have a lot of good state documentation out there, PAPDs, IEPDs, but not everybody has been willing so far to raise their hand and go, yep, we're gonna be ACA compliant. Uh, and put their name on it. So that's been, the, that's been the rub right there for now, but we think that's gonna change very soon. Uh, we're hoping so anyways. We will be publishing uh, these best of, of breed, we, we call it uh, PAPDs and IAPDs, on the interoperability website. Uh, ACF's website just came up last week. It's a work in progress. Uh, but it is up now, CMS has one as well, uh, and we're hoping that FNS will, will get one as well. And we'll have that uh, published up there uh, for everybody to download. If the documents tend to be too large, what we will do is we'll break them apart so that they can be downloaded in pieces and put back together. Um, there are a number of other initiatives uh, that I could go into. 
Uh, the National Human Service Interoperability Architecture is one. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the, da the Standard Data Act that has been uh, put, its standard language has been put into the 4A um, refunding, um, the 4B last September, uh, and in the Department of Labor's uh, reauthorization. It's also been proposed in the child support, the 4D uh, International Child Support uh, Act that's floating, that's been passed actually, I think, on, on the House side and it's got to pass on the Senate side. So uh, that's another uh, opportunity for interoperability that's going to basically ask states to standardize the data that they're uh, transmitting to the federal government, to their various federal programs. Standardize the exchange of that data, I should say. So the federal office, OMB is going to set up a working group on that. Uh, it'll, con it'll be a mix of state representatives and federal representatives. Um, and they'll lead that. They'll identify what the, the uh, first data sets are going to be for those programs. And then we will uh, take that and actually work with uh, our state partners to standardize those, those exchange models. That is where ACF stands right now with interoperability. We've got a lot of other projects, obviously, but they don't really uh, touch on what you're going to touch on next, which is the uh, exchanges themselves and the federal exchange. And with that, I'll turn it over to Henry. Sorry, I, I have to get up and walk around. I, I have a problem talking sitting, is particularly in those chairs. I don't know about you guys, but it's killing my butt. You know. <laughs> Maybe it's because I'm too big. I don't know. Um, <laughs> carrying all the weight of the insurance exchanges, right? I don't have a butt, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> so uh, it's, uh, you know, where do I start? I don't rarely have problems, you know, kind of uh, having something to say. It's about how do I condense it, shape it, filter it, um, you know, be able to convey it in such a way that I don't lose 80% uh, of the audience, which sometimes people tell me that I do because I either get too, in too much detail or I throw too much stuff out, uh, folks. So I really want this to be an interactive session. If you have a question, you don't know what I'm saying, I might mention an acronym, just feel free to raise your hand and stop me and, and ask. Um, I'm here to really uh, support a discussion, a dialogue to help you understand where things are at relative to uh, if you're interested about insurance exchanges and how they work, all the way to uh, what CMS's thought process behind the human service, you know, kind of integration aspects of it. Um, and, um, and what exactly are the opportunities that we talk about versus the challenges and, you know, within the time constraints that we have. So I'll start off with uh, some key uh, dates. I, I know you mentioned program uh, startup is January 1st, 2014, but uh, so much has to happen before then. Does anybody have any idea uh, what's the first core set of functionality that has to be available and by what date? that has to be available by in order to start this process so that you actually can offer open enrollment by uh, October of 2013? Does anybody know? Can you speak up? July of 2013? Yeah, plan management. Try somewhere around November of this year. The reason why is that if you take open enrollment and you kind of start that date, October 1st, and you go backwards, in order for you to determine eligibility and to enroll and to calculate the appropriate premium tax credit in the exchange, uh, you have to have a plan benefit to, uh, to kind of enroll these people in. Because that benefit and all that defined, you know, kind of attributes of that coverage uh, and, uh, and price and rating it goes into calculating, uh, you know, the metal levels, and then within the metal levels, uh, within each household, uh, what is the premium tax credit depending upon the uh, the uh, FPL. So, 
Uh, you know, that's really kind of an early date. That's, uh, that's what, uh, probably uh, three, four months tops of, of working days in which we have to get this uh, system into uh, testing. And that's really, that system has to be up and running to support the workflow uh, and the approval process for uh, qualified health plan certification, what we call QHPs. And QHPs need to be certified sometime around March of 2013, but the process whereby uh, issuers or insurance companies or health plans build their product and, and, uh, and define what that product offering is and to submit it into this approval process. Uh, current day, you know, um, in, in NAIC terms, it's, uh, it's rate and form filing. But it's a much more extensive process uh, that's involved because the current um, today practice of rate and form filing is rather simplistic. There isn't a lot of data in that process, um, largely because there isn't this thing called guaranteed issuance. Uh, when you enroll into or request an enrollment into a product, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm saying the individual market and small group, you have to go through a, an underwriting process that actually looks at you know, your health status and various other indicators and then determine what your premium is. Well, in the insurance exchange program, that has to be done in much uh, quicker fashion because it's a guaranteed uh, issuance uh, kind of environment. So all that plan work, that plan management work, to bring in that structured data, to be able to do the calculation that I mentioned, including even earlier um, aspects of supporting consumer decision making or consumer education about how to choose the appropriate product for themselves, I mean, it's, it's really a mystery for people who have insurance today. I mean, if I poll the audience, say, okay, the last time you, know, you were offered open enrollment, did you sit down and look at you know, the 12 different types of uh, you know, benefits that your employer offered, and did you actually study every one and you know, you, did you model out your, you know, based upon your family's you know, kind of coverage and needs that you knew what your uh, out-of-pocket cost would be for uh, the coming year? It's very hard to do that. And insurance, health insurance, the way it works today is that on the the marketing front end, it kind of gives you some idea of what the benefit is, but the true cost of that doesn't occur until after the benefit starts and claims begin to be submitted and, you know, calculation of co-insurance, co-pays, deductibles, that begins to kind of kick in and then you get a sense of what it's like. It's very difficult to kind of project what that's like when you don't uh, even have a good experience with, uh, um, with choosing a kind of health plan coverage. So this will be a huge challenge. The data that we collect through that plan management process has to fuel the ability for us to create comparison tools, plan finder tools, to help people make decisions, to help brokers and agents to be able to, uh, to sell products uh, in, in a general category, what we call assisters, or some people say navigators, um, to, uh, to uh, assist people to make choices. Because typically, uh, I think, uh, does anybody think that, um, that of the 18 million that's projected to uh, be enrolled in the exchanges, do you think the majority of the 18 million are going to purchase their coverage through the insurance portal and never ask anybody any question? Does anybody think that that's the model? That's the prevailing model? Good. I really hope, I really hope you didn't raise your hands not because you're sleepy, but because you agree with me. We are going to establish an insurance portal but that's probably not the, the vast majority of folks that are going to be seeking information probably, uh, you know, and hopefully around uh, mid-year of 2013, maybe summer of 2013, uh, to begin to start, uh, you know, kind of engaging the decision-making process, the selection process, the education and outreach process, of which by the time they get to open enrollment, uh, you know, uh, there's good familiarity with you know, how the process is going to work and what kind of uh, benefits and, and coverage uh, are available. Hopefully, that's, that's uh, what we're working on. So starting with plan management, it's actually, like I said, November of this year, that system has to be up. Um, there'll be what's called a payment notice that goes out to issuers, the insurance companies that will uh, you know, start bidding and, and formulating their, uh, their offerings and then submit them sometime around March. Uh, to be certified as a qualified health plan sometime in April. And then once we have that data, we could start populating, you know, our, uh, the starting with our portals, our uh, enrollment systems. So that's, uh, that's really kind of how the progression will occur. Um, with the eligibility and enrollment pieces also working in tandem, but not really needing to be uh, actually up and running until 
uh, about uh, uh, October of 2013, but maybe perhaps um, um, hopefully 30 to 60 days prior to that, uh, engage in some, um, some testing, uh, robust testing with uh, key stakeholders. So does anybody know, does everybody know how the process is going to work? Not, ne not necessarily accounting for Medicaid uh, and CHIP, but in the standard exchange process flow, does there, is, are people familiar with how that's gonna work? Excuse me. It starts with um, a couple of key uh, verification services, uh, of which this thing called the Data Services Hub is involved. The exchange, any exchange, it could be a state-based exchange, a partnership model, a fairly facilitated exchange, will perform these steps of verification starting with uh, things like citizenship and immigration status, um, to validate uh, a, a accurate and, you know, and, um, uh, a social security number, to um, uh, use that validated social security number to a query against um, SSA, I mean, uh, excuse me, SSA, IRS for uh, income uh, tax information, the tax return data, uh, which IRS will return uh, what's called a modified adjusted gross income uh, with uh, a count of how many people were reported in that tax house household. Uh, and again, this is not the Medicaid household, this is the standard tax reporting household as IRS sees it. And then uh, using that um, and then mating it with a plan selection uh, to be able to calculate the, um, the advanced premium tax credit for uh, that given uh, enrollment in that household at that particular FPL, uh, and then uh, taking their elected choice for a request for enrollment and effectuating it by sending a standard, you know, 834 transaction uh, to the issuer, uh, of which and the issuer will kick off their process uh, and send out a, um, a, it could be actually live in some cases, uh, a kind of a premium notice. And then the consumer pays that premium either through a credit card online uh, or through a, a kind of a slower process. And then once that premium is received from at the health plan, there's a confirmation that the enrollment uh, is effectuated. Now, this is going to be rather complex, particularly during open enrollment, because uh, of all the churn. And, and there's a lot of overlap, but as you can understand, the other 18 million is, is uh, uh, you know, the expansion uh, in Medicaid and CHIP. Uh, there'll be some um, kind of situations where Medicaid will perform these redeterminations to find these people uh, potentially and uh, during open enrollment, um, they're moving from Medicaid to um, exchange and during that October to uh, the December 31st period, you have to be able to project you know, the Medicaid picture in the following year. So it's, it's gonna be a rather uh, complex undertaking. So once that enrollment is effectuated, um, with the pre advanced premium tax credit. Let's say we used um, the IRS income data. So how old is that data? If you query IRS in October of 2013, what uh, income data do you get? You get 2012, right? Um, and once you kick off the benefit and you're receiving, it could be pretty hefty. I, th I think for a family of four, um, you know, moderate, uh, you know, maybe uh, 150, uh, 180, you know, FPL, you can get um, perhaps like around nine, ten thousand $10,000 in premium assistance. And the, so that's a big chunk of money that IRS is going to pay the issuer that you enrolled in their health plan product, along with some cost sharing subsidies if, if you qualify. Um, so, so the year benefit year starts in uh, January 2014, and um, you are a seasonal worker, and uh, you know in the beginning of the year you don't have employment, but towards the middle of the year you have a huge spike in your income, and towards the end of the year you didn't report that spike in income to have your pre advanced premium tax credit adjusted to what was you know, kind of real, uh, you know, according to your income, so. Uh, what happens to you on the back end? Well, you, have, you go through a reconciliation process, and that reconciliation process is using the tax, re, uh, the tax filing mechanism to ensure that you, number one, met the individual mandate, number two, that you were paid the appropriate premium tax credit, not too much, not too uh, little. So if you had a sudden rise in income, but you didn't go back into the insurance exchange so that we can adjust uh, what your advanced premium tax credit was, 
what will happen is that you could potentially be looking at a fairly large tax bill because it's part of the tax process now. Everybody, raise your hand if you didn't know that. Okay. That is, uh, when I speak at conferences, I always mention this. Um, and is there anybody from IRS in the room? <laughs> Yeah, my IRS counterparts don't like the fact that I emphasize that uh, the, 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 the front end of the process is a very, um, you know, kind of, um, uh, not necessarily, I would say, user-friendly or consumer-friendly, but it's, it's a little more forgiving than the back end, which is the tax process. You know, so in health and human services, most of our systems rely, like if you don't have data to process or a person doesn't have up-to-date information, we do things like what we call deeming. We say, okay, you know, we'll give you this benefit and then you can catch up later. Not in all cases, but it happens a lot. On the back end, does IRS ever say, you know what, that tax bill you owe, we, I, we, we're gonna let you go on that, you know? <laughs> You can, you can check back with us a couple of years later. That does not happen. So this, this potential you know, kind of intersection between a fairly loose front end with a high precision you know, kind of uh, you know, reconciliation back end, you can see that uh, it, there's, there's a lot of potential for uh, some problems and some issues. Correct, and it's happened before with the earned income tax credit. So um, I, I think that there's a huge educational component with this uh, about people who qualify for this. But you know, uh, at least at least uh, one upside to it is that it's paid directly to the issuer. It's not paid to the individual. But the downside is when there was too much paid, the person is then responsible for it. Okay, so uh, so it's not like you know it, it it's something that uh, that is related directly back to you and that you can control it. Like, pe some people like to put you know 17 exemptions so they have no taxes taken and then they figure it out. The rest of, you know they save the money during the year. IRS frowns on that, but you know that, you know we we just have to make sure people understand what they're getting into. Um, so so I mentioned high precision data on the back end. That means IRS requires accurate enrollment records, not necessarily even by year, but by enrollment periods. Because every enrollment period has a start and an end date, a start and an end date. If you're six months in Medicaid uh, and six months in premium tax credit land, but they're not six and six, they're you know, three, 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 we have to make sure we have that data correct. Otherwise, the reconciliation can be a huge problem. All right, so that's kind of the standard um, um, plain model of how things will work. Uh, let's talk about the state-based exchange partnership model and the federally facilitated exchange. It, in the law, it says that the Secretary of HHS shall establish uh, an insurance exchange uh, when a state is, uh, doesn't have one for, for, for any variety of reasons. So what happens? Well, there's this two options. There's a fairly facilitated exchange in which we basically, the federal government comes in and kind of tries to perform a lot of the eligibility enrollment, plan management pieces, customer service, uh, and, uh, and to, to kind of start that process for a state, maybe until such time a state is ready to uh, assume, you know, kind of uh, their own exchange, um, or operate it indefinitely. Uh, and then a partnership model is just a variant of that in, in that the state might choose to do plan management or customer service, uh, but the, the feds will uh, perform eligibility enrollment. So what does that exactly look like? Does anybody think that the federal government is going to open up offices in states that have fairly facilitated exchange? We'll have a bricks and mortar presence in a state. Does everybody think that? No, that's not gonna happen. Oh, there's a person in the back over there. <laughs> Yeah. We were thinking about buying a fleet of RVs. <laughs> That's actually not going to happen. So this is going to be a very precarious situation, right? The, the, the technology, and I'll talk about that later, um, is going to facilitate the ability to really kind of perform these functions ubiquitously. And, uh, but the problem here is that, uh, going back to what I said earlier, what is the typical consumer expectation today when they're trying to engage a, um, a, a process 
to determine things like premium assistance, subsidies, uh, you know, human service, uh, you know, kind of uh, engagement, those kind of things. Uh, do they just kind of uh, choose themselves? They you know, log into a website and create an account, and next thing you know, they're they're having the they're experiencing these benefits. Does any state do that right now? No, it requires typically someone to actually help them to become the assister in uh, filling out applications, you know, uh, navigating the labyrinth, potential labyrinth of, of you know, processes that exist. So how is uh, the federally facilitated exchange going to uh, potentially service uh, a consumer that comes in that may or may not be initially uh, advanced premium tax credit eligible and are Medicaid and uh, potentially a, a child in the household eligible for CHIP. Well, we're examining the ability to uh, pull these uh, uh, modified adjusted gross income, the new MAGI income rules that came out as part of the regs to process uh, that determination that is MAGI related in the federally facilitated exchange, and then if it's determined that we can go down that processing path, and it's not premium tax credit, and it's not above 400% FEL, and it's some Medicaid and CHIP potential eligibility determination or an assessment, as some of the policy folks have said it, we would then take that uh, developed kind of case uh, uh, about this household or an individual uh, and, be, and send it over to the state Medicaid uh, agency or CHIP, CHIP agency, or it could be the same um, kind of intake point. That is the proposition on the table right now, and that is the one thing that worries me most these past several weeks, because as we sit down with the policy folks at the federal level that is looking at these 23 MAGI-related Medicaid and CHIP categories, I begin to get concerned that Number one, we don't have a bricks and mortar presence, right? So who's going to help these people? And if they're going to come to an insurance portal and fill out a uniform application for enrollment, we're gonna to have to do some semblance of this based upon our ability to, number one, understand those rules because they are not, at least I'm not aware of any standalone MAGI income test rule and you pass that one rule and you're in. It's generally MAGI plus some other aspect of, you know, of, of some kind of a determination test or a determined set, determination set of business rules. And the, the less we know about that, the more dangerous it becomes about trying to process in an automated fashion, you know, uh, applying those rules against an application to make a determination. Uh, and, and then even more uh, dangerous, I think, is on an ongoing basis in a, in a complex situation where Initially, you uh, pull the household income. It comes from uh, IRS as a single you know, MAGI with a count of number of people in the household. You can't see who contributed to that total. And then you'll have to kind of reconstitute that household to do the Medicaid income test and then potentially a CHIP income test. That's something the federal government doesn't actually do today right now. And the requirements from the policy side is telling me that the system that my staff have to build and contractors has to perform that, and that worries me a lot, okay? Because even though based upon your counts, you know, about uh, glasses half full, glasses half empty, I am preparing to potentially staff up uh, and support 40 fed federally facilitated exchanges slash partnership models in, to some varying degrees because Honestly speaking, I look at the, the progress that states are making in the aggregate, and I don't see a lot of progress. I see a lot of things that, for example, if you're a state and you don't have an RFP out on the street, um, and you're, or you're actually not in the award discussion uh, phase, you're, you're really, really behind. Because by the time you get it out there, the 14 states or whatever number, they've hired the CGIs, the CSCs, the Accentures, the Deloittes, and they pulled all those resources in to supporting those states. You're gonna be competing to a, with a much smaller, smaller set of resources that are available out there if you wait longer. That's just a, you know, that's just one, you know, kind of downside to it. Never mind not having enough time. Well, the policy folks, 
you, you know, how many policy folks are in the room or have been and you actually admit it? <laughs> well, policy folks have, uh, have uh, a very, you know, they're, they're typically very passionate about what they want to achieve. But I find that policy people have a tendency to design a program that works really well on, in PowerPoint. And, <laughs> and when you say things like, hey, you know, let's take the 23 MAGI new national income rules, uh, you know, income test rules, and let's put it in the federally facilitated exchange, and because they're the same across the nation, it should be okay, right? You know, I mean, on paper, it sounds pretty good, right? It, you know, my medic, is anybody here left from, is Julie still here? Nobody from CMS is left here? Good. Ah, I could say, <laughs> turn the tape off. I could say anything I want, right? <laughs> it's really a t tall order because, um, and, I, and I'll tell you an interesting story. Um, uh, you know, Rick back there, I worked for Rick for 10 years, you know that? So he's kind of like the guy that taught me my first 10 years of Medicaid. And so if I get something wrong, it's his fault. <laughs> but. You know, when I started working, someone handed me a book called The Medicaid Experience, a hardbound book, you know, and um, I revisited uh, about a month ago when I started kind of working on, uh, you know, trying to figure out how we're going to do this uh, eligibility determination. And there was a chapter in this book that talked about um, the inefficiencies of the SSA interface and SSA should do a better job in creating timely data. Um, it talked about the feds should give uh, states more flexibility in building systems and better guidance to build modular systems. And uh, I found it very interesting. So I copied the, the, um, the chapter out. I redacted anything that uh, related or gave you a sense of what year it was written. And I gave it to uh, a person I know in Medicaid. And I said, tell me what year this was written. And she said, nah, 1990s. Nope. It was written in 1979. Those very same problems that that chapter was listing still exist today. So what makes us collectively think that by 2013 we're going to be able to fix this problem or improve upon it in such a short amount of time? Granted, the opportunity is there. The window is there to start on a path, on a journey that I spoke about it this morning informally, that we're talking about a progression of of, of targets that we, wa we all agree on, that I see on, these, on this very colorful, well-drawn out, they're all targets. How do we get there? We have to be able to negotiate, you know, where are the intervals in which we are going to create that convergence, that interoperability that we keep on talking about. And interoperability, as the group I was on, it's defined, you know, at the business level, at the data level, at the technology level. And, you know, without that, I think you know it's very dangerous to kind of proceed and to uh, to take a, a policy objective and to just um, you know kind of accept that it's somehow going to work by uh, open enrollment in 2013 because we can actually make things worse. Is any program going away in 2013 when we start open enrollment? Does anybody know of anything that's being taken off the table? No. Actually, it's. The exchanges will come up amidst everything that exists today, individual and small group market, and amidst the uh, Medicaid redeterminations. On top of that, there's, um, there's a lot of common you know, patterns. When you build systems, you're looking for uh, similar patterns, particularly in a, in a SOA architecture. It's all about pattern, uh, pattern recognition and, and architecting and engineering these patterns that are, that are repeatable. Um, and there are certainly uh, very, very repeatable patterns here that are, that are familiar. Some kind of eligibility verification, some kind of determination process, a, a payment calculation, a capitation calculation, a risk adjustment formula. Um, you know, so there's a lot of patterns. What is not the same is that this is not an underlying insurance fund. Does everybody realize that? This is a premium assistance program out of the general revenue of the Treasury. So. When we are pointing and shaping and channeling people into the exchange to purchase a product and we offer them advanced premium tax credit assistance, 
that's not paying the full ride. They still have to pay out of their own pocket for this. So there is no publicly underlying insured fund or Medicare trust fund that is paying for this. So whatever experience we create, and we all talk about this user experience and, and in the beginning, Zeke Emanuel, you know, one of our earlier meetings, he said, yeah, I want the people in the exchange to have a world-class experience. And you know, that was like two and a half years ago. I think we're down to uh, you know, like not necessarily a world-class experience. Let's just make sure that they don't like repeat the same information over and over again, kind of like what I heard other early people say. I, I think that we're we're coming to a realization that we're running out of time and we really need to have to focus on what is the that the, the minimum shippable product that we can get the program started and then continue to work on all these things that we have targeted as uh, as you know desirable outcomes. Uh, on behalf of the people that we serve. And I think that that, that you know, b because it is uh, this individual mandate, individual responsibility uh, of which, you know, uh, people have to pay for this care for themselves, assisted by, you know, some premium tax credit, um, this is, we owe, we owe this consumer experience to folks that, that are, uh, you know, like you and I. I. If we pay for something, we, we want to kind of be in control and we have expectations that it is a good experience and an understandable experience for us. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. It's, it, we don't live in a perfect world today. And, and we ought not to think that, you know, because we project this, you know, kind of very, uh, seamless experience model that is just going to happen. We have to be very careful and cautious about you know what kind of trade-offs we make uh, between now and and uh, and when the program starts and and then you know how do we then once it gets started how do we begin to optimize how do we you know kind of track you know measure performance agree on what the performance is agree on the measures of what exactly does interoperability mean and and be able to kind of produce this the you know to produce on those objectives in those outcomes that we talk about so i think about i think i covered about pretty much uh, everything i wanted to I, I don't i don't i don't mean to like discourage you guys or to depress you <laughs> um, you should be invigorated that this is a huge challenge <laughs> people in this room have um, a user ID to CALT? Does anybody know what CALT is? Okay. That's our collaboration space in which we actually do have a lot of uh, development artifacts of which we're beginning, um, we, we are creating the early structure for what we call a services registry. And that services registry will be, uh, for design time purposes, will be made available uh, and will be public facing. Um, and you can get to it through uh, CALP. It's not quite there yet, maybe another month or so. And so um, the states and their active contractors that are supporting them right now can actually begin to pull this down and begin, uh, at des uh, for design purposes, understand what services are, are a you're able to consume um, as part of your build out of uh, whatever parts of the exchange that you can, you can build. No one state is really that advanced, and you know, a lot of people like to uphold Massachusetts, right? Now, I, I think Massachusetts has, is, is doing really well, but do you know why they're doing well? Does everybody understand why Massachusetts is doing well? It's because they have the people. It's because they have the organization. They have people who are accountable, responsible, that already run an operation, that understand how to get this done. States that are still forming or they have loose, you know, kind of cadre of people. Uh, I'm not saying that that's not impossible. Bill was telling me <laughs> um, that, uh, you know, he could spin up a, a crew, like, overnight, right, Bill? Like, within the day? Okay. Two nights, right? So, um, uh, you know, that's that's a pretty tough thing to do. Uh, to build a team of folks that really understand, number one, the policy interpretation that makes sense at the state level, the 
policy interpretation to operational uh, details at the county level, right? So that the caseworker might know or eligibility worker might know like what has to happen first, second, and third in the 10 steps of my process today to get somebody enrolled in the health and human service, you know, kind of process. I have an 11th step that involves the exchange now. Now, how do you, you know, kind of make that happen? Give them a system, give them an interface, give them a, 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 a user interface, give them a process, give them training, give them documentation so they know how to do their job. That takes a long time to do. Am I wrong? So, I have another question. Well, it, yeah, first of all, you're going to send them Medicare, I mean, Medicaid eligible, and I, at some point, you're also, I, I would imagine that the exchanging it needs to see if people might be enrolled in Medicaid before issuing a premium test to see if they're, if they, maybe they should be moving out. You know, the churn back and forth for states who don't intend to be really involved in, in the HPE. Right. Is, I'll, I'll, I'll even you know one up you on that you know premium tax credit, premium tax credit are calculated on an annualized basis. It's projecting the future. In Medicaid, you take income at a point in time, and then you'll have to annualize it going on in the future. How how reliable is that? So, you know, I I think there's a lot of things that exist today that we just have to respect and bear in mind that they will be represent huge challenges. Now, your your assertion about the APDs, I don't know when was the last time you read an APD. Um, it doesn't really, it doesn't really say a whole lot, except when states take their RFP and they stuff it into the <laughs> APD, right? You know, so. Right now, it's it's a matter of having you know kind of smaller audiences like this, and to roll up our sleeves and to understand the business process. Number one, you know this secret of interoperability, right? You gotta understand what's the, what's in totality, what's the process that's going to actually work? How am I gonna create those handoffs? I have some policy folks telling me that just design a system that does those 23, uh, you know, MAGI related categories, process a result, and if a state doesn't like it, you know, we'll call it an assessment and we'll just throw it at them, you know? Uh, and I'm thinking, that's not gonna work. You know, because it's, it's not a matter of, I, I have all the state's knowledge that I could build into a self-contained process going through these 23 sets of rules and then some, some point in the process, it's fully baked and I'm ready to give it to you. And what if you don't agree with it? There's no discussion about, you know, uh, if you don't agree with it, you could reject it, but then what do I do with it? And who gets, who gets caught in that kind of a, of a, of a system to system conversation? Right, so I, I think what I'm trying to shift a conversation to is stick with what you know. Stick with the, you know, what you can actually control, and that is we can try to use IRS data or self-attest or if we could manage to, um, maybe not initially, but ongoing, connect to other sources of data that the federal government has, uh, you know, like we had this conversation about FPLS, right? And, and to, to be able to tap into other sources of data that we can you know, help uh, continue this process of processing the uh, you know, application for enrollment, um, and, and then determining if, if they're not premium tax credit eligible and they're not uh, above 400% FPL, then we think they're Medicaid or CHIP eligible and we uh, send a notification to the state to actually take over. We build a little case file that resembles the, as much of the uniform application that's uh, completed and ship it to a state in a way a state can actually consume it. And then be able to build also uh, an exception handling process so that people are not caught in the middle. 
I mean, that's the conversation that I really want to have. I mean, I think the, the policy is such that, you know, it's already written in reg that the FFE is going to do these determinations. Now let's figure out, you know, what's the best way to actually do that. No, this is just through initial analysis with the policy, uh, you know, kind of folks that wrote the regs, yeah. you know, Ben Walker and Amory Costello and Sarah Delone. They've plucked these out and said these are probably the ones that are uh, can be fairly consistent across all states. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. So there could be additional ones that aren't consistent. Yes. Right, and, and to me, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not a policy person, and, and so you know, I'm not trying to step into that, that domain, but to me, those 23 actually don't represent 23 discrete you know, uh, self-contained processes. You're, you're running these rules against families, you know, against households that are uh, you know, kind of you have to aggregate and disaggregate, and it's not so easy that if you do an income test that you don't wind up doing three other tests in order to make it meaningful within the workflow of how you do that determination. I mean, at least that's the way I was raised by Rick. <laughs> but I just need some help. I mean, I, I, I offered you know, uh, the ability for states to contact me and, and to sit down and work this out. Uh, of course, you know, the policy folks will want to make sure that they're in the room, so I'm not uh, speaking for them. Um, but we can certainly, you know, kind of make arrangements and kind of get to that level of detail that we need to in order to kind of have this agreement so that if you're a state-based exchange and you need to really understand what's available to you from the data services hub, such as, um, hey, I want to make sure that before I enroll them in Medicaid health plan that they're not already in a premium tax credit plan. And if I want to do that, I could send you a disenrollment request because I'm enrolling them in, in, uh, in a Medicaid uh, health plan. That kind of a scenario. As opposed to, it's a federally facilitated exchange and the sequence, the orchestration occurs a little bit differently. And you're, you're dealing with, uh, with uh, like some legacy systems and uh, federally facilitated exchange capabilities. Well, thank you very much. Okay, as I indicated earlier, we do have a responder panel, and um, we've asked them to think about how the federal government could help them without asking for additional time. <laughs> With, without asking for additional time, how could, how could we be helpful how could the, this panel be helpful in, in you meeting your deadlines for implementation? Okay, I'm gonna ask Bill Hazel to go first. I asked to go last. I'm sorry. That's okay, that's okay. Um, Henry, on behalf of this group, thank you for doing this job. I mean, um, you, you may... <laughs> I mean, I, I mean that sincerely because somebody's got to do it, and I sure am glad it's not me, and I suspect I speak for most of the folks in the room. This is a really tough one, so glad you're there. Um, I, I think I need you to come to Virginia and explain this to the legislature because they may actually decide after you've spoken to them that we are going to defer to the feds and you can build one for us too. Um, it, it is, uh, it's incredibly complicated. Now, I guess the, the, the uh, I, I almost don't know, having listened to you, how I can advise you how to help us. I, it is, it is, but there are, I think the basic things we've already covered, um, number one, uh, things that aren't in your shop, we can, I can't speak to, because the policy stuff needs to come out. Um, clearly, a, a very quick understanding of your timelines of what you intend or would theoretically like to get things out to us so we know what to expect is it would be important the and and I understand that you know if I'm where you are maybe I don't want to make those hard and tight because then people wonder why you miss those deadlines but um, giving us some idea of when you will have what that's available in terms of programs or even artifacts that we can use. I think that the ability to use your artifacts would be very helpful. We did discuss, I think what you and Larry were talking about is important, the ability such as, as you can 
to do things once that all of us would have to do over and over and over again makes a lot of sense. To the extent that you can give us something in OPA or BPOL, whatever, that, that we can use where we have the, our, the system architecture to support it, I think would be very, very useful. Um, What's that? The Microsoft guys here are upset. First of all, you, uh -huh. I didn't say BEPL, okay. BPL, what did I say? <laughs> My own guys, I don't get no respect. He's making fun of me. <laughs> the Microsoft. The Microsoft. He's still upset that you didn't mention him in your list up there, Henry. That was, did you see him get agitated? <laughs> so so I, think, I think really those, those are sort of some of the big ones that, w that we need. You know, anything that can be done that can be done you know, that saves us from reproducing, do it. Give us some sense of your timelines. And hearing you lay out what's coming when I think was very helpful today in terms of getting there. Um, you know, Mary says, I can't ask you what the chances are of getting more time, but one thing that we all have to worry about, there's the technical details of all of this, but the, the issues related to funding are very real, and everybody asks me, well, what are you going to do with the Supreme Court decision? And the answer is the Supreme Court decision, ladies and gentlemen, is a blip. I hate to say it, it's a big blip because it makes a lot of difference to what we do for the next year or so. But what really is we're going to have to deal with, and I know that none of us control that, is what is the federal financial situation going to allow going forward? Um, we, are, we are very concerned in the states, and this will, will impact you, about potential cuts in Medicaid match. We have a 50% match rate for care. And we hear talk as part of the balanced budget, we're going to see that cut. So if that is cut, and this is, again, not a technology issue, but what happens down the road to what's been promised for people who are not yet receiving benefits? Because the states are not necessarily in a position financially to fill in for that. So I mean, these are the types of things that, that I worry about. But um, I, I'm not sure I've helped you help us very much in, in this. Um, Joel, I think you're next. Josh, Josh is next. Thank you, good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? No. I think that might work. <laughs> Hi, I'm Josh Sharpstein. I am the Secretary of Health for the state of Maryland, the state we're all in right now. Um, th this is pretty impressive gathering. I'm just uh, showing up to my first conference today. I realized that if this building were structurally unsound, the entire field of integration would be set back by several decades. <laughs> so I realize how fortunate we are to have such an incredibly uh, senior and talented group of people here. I want to thank uh, Professor Gaskin for leading it off. He is on our board. He's kind of a quiet member of the board, but I didn't realize he uh, has this level of uh, detailed understanding, so he's getting drawn into a whole bunch more discussions from, from here on in. <laughs> um, and uh, I also want to thank uh, Dr. Hazel from Virginia. We were um, recently on a panel together, and I'm constantly struck by, despite the fact that we're from states with obviously some somewhat different uh, political bends, that a lot of the challenges we're facing are the same, and that uh, he is incredibly dedicated to getting things to work for, for his state as, as I am in mine. Um, actually, after our last appearance, I got uh, four phone calls from a reporter trying to get me to disagree with you about whether I was worried about the Medicaid budget being a problem. And finally, I was like, I agree with him. I, you know, <laughs> the, the Medicaid budget is an issue. We have to make sure I think all states have that. Um, I think that for, there, there were a couple things that were, were um, hit on, but I, from, from our perspective in Maryland, where we are certainly trying to be a state-based exchange, relying on the data hub as opposed to a, a fully federally facilitated exchange, I think that the, the major issues for us are standing up in the short term, um, hitting the, the various deadlines for our, um, and being able to open for enrollment in the fall of 2013. Um, I think that the key issues are the exchange issues, some of which you mentioned, but also the Magi Medicaid determinations, which are challenging for us because um, our old way of doing Medicaid eligibility is hardwired into a legacy system, so we have to figure out a new way to do that. Um, and uh, the other um, 
major issue is that, and I thought it was interesting um, that y your perspective was on the long-term integration, which we absolutely agree with. You know, we should, it, that is not anything that can be accomplished by, you know, July 2013, that that's going to take at least a few years to, to really move down the road. But we've got this interim period, which is going to be a challenge, I think. Um, you know, the way I look at it in public health, which um, is my background, not so much IT, the key question is always compared to what? And the compared to what right now is just a terrible situation. I mean, we, we have so many little different systems. It's been a long time that the rules at the federal level and the funding didn't align like it's starting to align now. So you know, I'm kind of hoping that this interim period, January 1, 2014, for the next couple of years, is a better interim period than we've kind of been living with. Um, but it's still not where we need to be. Um, and I think. Uh, particularly that's important for the workflow of the different workers who have to do things because they'll be even though we've sort of got like a contraption right now where a certain you know a single family could go through multiple different eligibility points um, but the um, at least everybody knows their job and it kind of fits then we're going to go through a new transition before we have a really integrated system where everyone's going to have to relearn I, I think how the system works and so we have the technical challenges then we have the workflow challenges um, and of course, we, we, you know, at the state level, there are plenty of policy challenges also. So I think in terms of help from the federal government, um, our perspective has been you've been enormously helpful because we every so often hit a uh, pretty critical branch in the road and uh, you're very accessible. I think that's really important. Um, we're not, I'm not, I can't predict uh, what, what the next branch point's gonna be, but accessibility and helping us think through the challenges, um, which you've been available and, and Henry's been available even at night if there are questions uh, or on very short notice to help us. It's just been incredibly helpful. Um, you know, I, I do agree with, with uh, Secretary Hazel that the, as different um, things that really work are identified, um, you know, to make them available to everyone. And I certainly agree in general that the more we can understand about the data hub as quickly as possible, the easier it will be to design our system in Maryland around it. Um, uh, I think that's pretty much all I would say. I don't know, we have uh, Sunny Rahija here who is our uh, uh, PMO for this whole project. I could not agree more with the statement that um, the critical ingredient is the human capital um, that, to, to stand it up. We're incredibly fortunate in Maryland to have a great exchange staff, Medicaid staff, human resources staff, and a PMO. And uh, I don't know, Sunny, is there anything you, you might want to add? Okay, well, Sunny will later tell everybody what I missed, but um, <laughs> um, incredibly politic. Um, but anyway, th thank you and look forward to any other points. Yeah, it's working. Oh, oh. <laughs> uh, so I'm Ivan Handler. I'm the uh, Chief Technology Office for the Illinois Office of Health Information Technology. My primary role right now is um, creating the Health Information Exchange for Illinois, which is linking um, many of these services plus other services. I was the CIO of our Medicaid agency for um, five and a half years before I did this. Um, this is a really interesting discussion, and I really appreciate everyone's input. Um, instead of getting on the same bandwagon I get on all the time, I thought I would <clears throat> make some other comments, though, because this um, really did stimulate a lot of thinking, but I have too many pages of notes to go over everything. So I'll just mention a few things. Um, so uh, Joe Bodner's, I think, started off with some really interesting ideas that I, um, one of the things I want to mention is you know, the idea that states have different data warehouses that could be really useful in this process in terms of evaluating what's happening, how we're making progress, what areas that we want to um, focus on is, you know, something the states are doing, but why not have a federal data warehouse? Why not aggregate all this data so we can look at it in a larger perspective? Because I think one of the problems a lot of states have is we can tell what we're doing, but it's hard to compare with other states and nationally what's going on. And that can be a very important um, element for policyholders uh, and you know, policy wonks and in general, the people that, and, and the state and federal um, 
government to understand these kinds of things. I think one of the frustrations that many of us at the state, at least at the technical level, face is that there's a kind of balkanization of, of things that have been going on for quite some time. I understand it's, there's reasons for it. It's not completely arbitrary, but um, technology has changed a lot, and we don't seem to have plans to really get out of that. We talk about it, but we don't really seem to have any concrete ways of, of moving forward, and I think that would be um, good. And the fact that Joe mentioned uh, the agile process, agile processes are one of the ways to do it. Um, we saw, <clears throat> was at a presentation from Google recently at HIMSS, uh, 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 Chicago-based HIMSS, and they mentioned that they made 233 different changes over the last year in their products, of which I don't think anyone was aware of because they took the Agile process in a serious way. And I'm just wondering, maybe that's a good, you know, that is a good model. Maybe that's one of the ways to think about moving forward rather than trying to get everything we want at once, which we know we're not going to get. But we need some strategic view and I think some leadership from the feds in terms of how we might get there. Right? And, it's, and I don't think it's just up to the feds alone. I think many of us in the states um, can and should step up to the plate to help figure this out. Um, but I think the, uh, the thing of just saying we don't have enough time, we've wasted too much time, we've lost things, and therefore we just got to do what we can becomes an excuse to keep things. You know, that's the reason why things haven't changed in some ways since, since, since the 1970s is because we always have this huge pressure and this backlog of things that gets in the way. And if we're going to get over it, we got to figure out some way to get over it. And uh, I think the Agile process is one possibility. Um, the other, I mean, obviously, what Henry covered was pretty intense, and I don't claim to understand all of it, but one of the things I also wonder is, so we've got these, t basically, we've got, a, it sounds like we have a workflow on the magic, which is about 23 different steps at a high level, and they're not decoupled. That is, you make a determination of one particular item, it's point A, and a couple steps down the line, we may redetermine what this is all about. Which, of course, in, in terms of the way things go computationally, if that's what's happening, makes life incredibly complicated. So one of the questions, because one of the things I would like to see, I wrote a paper on this, it's kind of a little simplified, would be, it'd be nice if the feds had all the things at the federal level, and then the states could use a service, some type of SOA service, to, as input for their process and then just make the modifications they needed. That would be a nice way of doing things, but based on what Henry just said, it doesn't seem like that's gonna be possible right now. So one of the questions I would have is maybe we could open it up, maybe open up that workflow so instead of the states and the feds having to try to agree on some things that maybe there isn't time to agree on, maybe the states could override each one of those steps if they needed to, so that we finally get a common conclusion. Um, it's going to be controversial and probably not perfect, but maybe that at least provides some kind of synergism so the states can take advantage of whatever work you've done. And you know we can work out the, the contradictions later. Which leads me to um, actually what Dr. Hazel pointed out before, which is maybe the other thing it would be really good to have is at least a strategic timeline. So we know we're not going to get what we want right now. We know we've got some, you know, there's legislation, there's deadlines, there's things we've got to do. Let's get them done. But can we at least have some ideas of a strategic timeline about what we can do next? And, and I think the state, and it's not just up to the feds, the states should be drawn into that conversation. But without that kind of timeline, without that kind of vision about here's how we're going to get from A to B, all we've really done is say, yeah, it's manana, we'll come up with the time, you know, we'll do this stuff later, it's gonna be agile, whatever, but in my experience, that's not concrete enough. It doesn't give us enough hold on things to hold each other accountable to make actual progress so that we end up, you know, operating in another kind of crisis mode, which is common, I think, both at the federal and the state level, and we don't really get to where we could get to. So I, I think these are some of the ideas that you know, how the feds and the states, maybe we could cooperate a little bit more, maybe we could manage to get a few things in place that are a little bit better than we've been expecting, but certainly at least have a strategic plan for how we can move in the future so that we can really get to where we want to get to. But in order to do that, we've got to get some commitments that we're going to really come up with a plan that'll get us there. 
and not allow all the other things which we know are going to happen to get in the way. We, you know, I th think that's w what I would like to see. I mean, I'm not sure that I ever get what I'd like to see, but that would be, <clears throat> if I had a wish, that would be one of them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Ivan. We, have, we do have time for a couple of more comments, and then um, Daniel's going to close for us. But right now, I have Uma Alawalia from Montgomery County. So uh, Mary asked me, do I want to make a county comment? And of course I do. Um, couldn't afford to miss the opportunity with my secretary in the room, so I, I had to take the chance. Um, but Josh pretty much heard all of my arguments. But I'm going to say a couple of things. I think for us at the local level, where integration and interoperability is already happening, where we're serving health and human services, service delivery systems at the ground level to our customers, consumers, clients, patients, whatever we call them, the t there is not time for us to say, okay, it's a few years out, and that's a tremendous anxiety for us. My eligibility staff right now are doing Medicaid food stamps and TANF all together in the same system. And what's gonna happen for a short period of time is they're likely gonna get peeled off. And there's, um, at a time when our caseloads have grown by 40%, our food stamp caseloads have grown by 136% in my county. And so my workforce doesn't have this, the resilience right now to try to learn another system for Medicaid. But that is gonna be the world we're gonna be in for a period of time, and it's frightening. And so part of my question, and there's been a lot of conversation all day today about state-federal partnerships. And the question is, how do you leverage locally? How do you leverage the locals to be your laboratories, to be where the innovation happens, to be the people who are bringing some of those workflow innovations to the table. And um, Sunny and Josh have been very gracious to allow us to sit at the table as they're mapping some of this stuff out. I would say that's critical for all local jurisdictions in our states because this cannot happen without the locals at the table. Whether they're state administered, state supervised systems or locally, state supervised, locally administered systems in both contexts, having local government to do some of the work and making decisions is extremely critical. And, and I think it's, both, it's, you know, and these are my favorite hotspots, right? Eligibility determination, navigation. These are places where we have a huge role to play. Um, and then the service delivery and the case management at the back end. Everybody's kind of focused right now on eligibility, but what happens when someone's deemed to be eligible into all these systems? What happens to case management, service delivery coordination, if someone's, you know, if you take the homeless diabetic, you're not just worried about homelessness, you're not just worried about the diabetes, you gotta bring those two worlds together. So that's the space I think that the locals can be incredibly useful and helpful. And so I would urge everybody in this room to continue to be thinking about how we can be at the table, we can be um, partners in the conversation, and really be a space where some of the experiments can take place. Thanks. Uh, Henry, I had a question. This also goes to the other two folks as well, but um, since most of the people in the audience are really coming from the human services world as opposed to Medicaid or health, and as you look to your right, there's this roadmap that's being developed in terms of the conversation that we've been having relative to the future of interoperability. I'm just curious um, if you could look beyond the crisis du jour of healthcare reform, the exchange and all of that stuff, assuming that there is a future after that, to what degree do you think um, health and human services can continue to work together on an interoperability path and a roadmap to get there? If you think back 10 years ago, where we were really quite separated, and today it seems like we're moving in the right path, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future relative to that? Is this one for you or me? It's for all of us. All right. Uh, Uma, I would say to you first, um, one of the 
project tasks that we have to initialize at ACF is to set up, set up what we call a steering committee. Uh, that steering committee is going to be the one to advise and consult with us as we go forward with our various interoperability initiatives. They will also be the ones to uh, sign off on, if you will, some of the deliverables that will be created as part of NEAM, for example, the National Human Service Interoperability Architecture, for example, uh, and a number of other project initiatives that we're looking at right now, such as confidentiality and privacy, uh, things of that nature. So there is an opportunity to be at the table and have a say about the direction of interoperability. And when we make the announcement, the solicitation of interest, uh, to all of our state and uh, county partners. Uh, I would hope that you'll be right there raising your hand, okay? Good. So Joe's not gonna answer your question about being an optimist or a pessimist. You know, I, I think I'm uh, neutral. Uh, I, I am cautiously optimistic. Um, I know there's a lot of, uh, I've been to more venues like this where we talk about uh, what the future, or what actually today or even sometimes yesterday should have been like. Um, and we lament about, you know, why can't we get along and why, are, why does everything have to be so different? And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of it is, uh, you know, working in IT and trying to uh, be the broker of, of conversations and planning between uh, multiple, you know, kind of entities. Like in this case, you know, we have uh, Medicaid, uh, you know, um, in CMS, and we have the Consumer Information Insurance Systems groups, you know, that uh, is kind of advocating um, f on behalf of the exchanges. And, you know, they don't always agree, and, and uh, their, uh, their priorities are different. But I, I think that at the end of the day, we, we do a lot of discussion, and. You know, we wind up being a lot more similar than we believe. So how do we, like, circumvent that? How do we stop wasting time uh, believing that we're different? And I think it starts in, in terms of, you know, systems development is to, uh, is to document what you do. And, you know, you can call it MITA. You can call it National Human Services Interoperability Architecture. You could call it these, you know, very nice pictures. It, there's, there's a first thing you have to do is you have to separate belief from fact and press and preferences from, uh, from fact. And that is, you know, we are all, uh, there's never, I never been to any of these discussions where there's a disagreement where the consumer or the patient or the, the recipient, uh, the client is not at the center of the universe. We all say that, but yet we, um, in, we trade things off. And when you don't understand what you do today, if you don't document that, then you don't understand what you're trading off. And, and I say this to uh, you know, uh, my, my business side all the time, and sometimes they don't get it, sometimes they do. And that is, that is you know, this, this longer term picture that I talked about is not um, a, um, a kind of uh, you know, Pollyannish you know, kind of uh, desire to lay out you know, this uh, actionable plan that looks like this landscape of this very colorful pictures. It is really to say that if you have these defined objectives that you can agree on and the outcomes, um, you know, at least you know that, that at certain intervals when you're choosing a, the basket of goods in A versus the basket of goods in B because B gets you across the finish line, gets the program started, but doesn't get you nearly all the things you need to get in place and objectives. At least you know what's, left, what's still left on the table to be done. I think we don't do enough of that, you know, kind of constant cross-checking that, you know, are we on track? Are we on target? Do we understand what we do today? And, um, and, not, uh, and not kind of go down this path over and over again. And to really uh, embrace that we are uh, much more similar than, uh, than we are different. And Rick, you know that that is the basis for why we started the Medicaid IT architecture effort, is because for a decade, you know, working for you, I listened to how states emphatically would state that you don't understand me, Mr. Federal Government, because I am different than the other state. When in 
at the end of the day, they are a lot more similar than, uh, than they would like to believe. And I think that this county, you know, kind of discussion, county level operations, uh, makes it even much more so because the, the, what UMA has, you know, kind of uh, indicated in terms of the increase in workload and not wanting to learn another system, that's true in possibly every county that uh, is trying to perform the service at the front line. So why is that different? You no, know, and and I and I think that it requires you know some um, some commitment. Uh, it requires uh, leaving a conference like this or a discussion like this, and actually going back and changing you know the, what you believe about how different you really are. If I could um, just add something to this this um, discussion. Um, it seems to me that, that um, on the sort of the human services side, you guys are, are in the information business. Um, and a lot of what you're, you're sort of um, uh, doing with both clients is, is using information to make decisions about services that people are going to be provided. And it seems to me that, that on the, the health side, uh, um, because of our payment systems and quality systems, we've had a need to, to really invest in IT infrastructure to develop performance measures and to, then to try to uh, provide tools that will assist people who are providing health care um, uh, to do a better job for their patients. And I think this presents an opportunity for you to, to sort of think about how you can not just do eligibility uh, determinations and trying to make sure that people get in the right programs, but also try to build systems that would better serve your, your, your case workers as they're trying to serve their clients. And to, um, I mean, we know that, that the social determinants of health determine um, health outcomes as well as uh, health care utilization. And so it, I think this presents a beautiful opportunity to do all the, the things in which we, we would like to be able to do in order to bring information to bear on how to better take care of patients and clients and so forth like that. And so I would, would encourage you to think not just about eligibility and these sort of determination issues, but what kinds of information do, does your respective staff, caseworkers need at their desks in order to do a better job for the person in which they're serving and to try to, to make sure that these systems incorporate that as opposed to just uh, being uh, on, on a real sense from your standpoint in an, an appendix that just tells, helps me do some eligibility things. Um, I think in terms of thinking about what, what appropriate performance measures that you could have for uh, clients who come through your system and, and what kinds of things you want to, to, to monitor. Uh, I, I think are, are very important, and and um, and this is the sort of the time to think about it because right now you have a pool of money in which someone's thinking about actually investing, and and whereas uh, maybe five years ago no one was thinking about investing in systems that data systems that you were working in, um, so so I would say this is this is the, the the opportunity to 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 get those things done and and to think about them in, in a real grand way, and I'm I'm sort of inspired by. All the colorful drawings that are around, and and I would encourage you to to be inspired too. Just just one thing, um, Mr. Bodmer had asked deliberately that I not stand up and misquote him, so I'm not going to quote him at all. Uh, just <laughs> you can be relieved, Joe. I wanted to um, first of all, uh, Daryl, your your most your last comments here were, were kind of right on. I think, um, Henry, the, the challenge we have, I think, is that we've all got this immediate issue, which is the health system reform and the health benefit exchange, and it is overwhelming. I really think we, we have to acknowledge supporters and opponents alike that the actual doing it is an overwhelming task. We also have to recognize that the money coming from Medicaid, the public out there construes that it is all related to health reform when it's not. I mean, I think it's really important to go back to what we heard this morning. 9010 is not ACA. And 9010 is the big picture. The big picture is taking the opportunity to invest long term in the things that allow us 
to know the customers we're serving. And I, I've got to tell you, every place I go in Virginia, we've been, Matt and I have been just about every place in Virginia, you sit down with a group of people, we have many summits with public health and social service and aging and behavioral health and all this, and the first thing they say is, we're different. And then they tell you why they're different, and you laugh. And they say, why are you laughing? He says, because that's what I heard up in Northern Virginia, where they say they're different, too. But it's the same thing. And the resource constraints that we have in social services and in the eligibility, is this is just a tool. And the tool is to build the underlying infrastructure, to be able to get good information, data and information, use the informatics, stratify your customers, figure out who you can help the most and how to do it. And that, the mission here, uh, with all due respect, we, we, yes, we do have to deal with the health benefit exchange, but the mission is much bigger and longer than that, in my opinion, and I think we got to, the message should be, we're here about trying to build something that works for our, our, our people, for our citizens. And it's going to be a long project, and yes, this health reform gets in, it's created an opportunity, but let's not, let's not lose that. And that's why I keep referring to the Supreme Court thing. Yes, it's a lot of work for all of us, depending on what they decide. It's going to make work one way or the other, but long term, the mission is a bigger mission than that. So thank you.